Okay, we're starting. I'm giving the last paper to, uh, in the first half of this research, uh, research paper section. And I'm going to give a paper called Dynamic Black Bears. Now, black bears are dynamic. They're really cool critters. But the title comes from dynamic programming. So not as exciting as it might seem. And this is a story about predictable food shortages, because bears lose their food every winter. And it's a story of how diverse species can use similar foraging rules. Now, it, it all started with data on, on black bears. And, and the data then led to, led to an hypothesis, which led to a model, which led to better understanding by me of black bears and the relationships to, to their food. Normally, I like to model first to develop hypotheses that I go test with the data. But this ended up being backwards. But it still, I think, is, is OK. Uh, I did the research in western North Carolina in, uh, in the mountains. They're the Blue Ridge Mountains. You can see why they're called the Blue Ridge. Terrible place to work. <laughs> Uh, high elevations, we had spruce fir forests, similar to, to up north. And along ridge tops, we had a, a diverse forest of, of predominantly oaks. And then down in the coves and valleys, we had magnolias and tulip poplars. It's, it's a neat place to work. We live trapped black bears starting in 1981. And we worked on the bears for uh, over 20 years. And we used modified leg hold snares that were modified to minimize injuries to the bears or basically eliminated them. And we did catch bears. We drugged bears. Uh, we measured them from tip to toe. We outfitted them with, with DHF collars. And then we let them go. <coughs> <laughs> Now, uh, when I showed the, 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 the map of, of my study area, you might have noticed that the Blue Ridge Parkway bisected the study area. And it ran along the major ridge, not exactly an even bisection, but pretty close to, to the middle of the study area. And we could drive up and down that, that, the Blue Ridge Parkway with our telemetry truck. And we could pick up bears just about no matter where they went in, in the study area. We, um, we located some bears as many as 400 times in their active season. So that's an average of, of about two locations per day. But they were generally grouped in, into uh, groups of, of location, four locations in eight hours, six and 12 hours, or 12 locations in 24 hours. And that way, we could look at the movement patterns of the bears uh, during, during those, those periods. Now, we plotted our, our locations on maps, and we made, we made home ranges. But we did other things, too. We developed uh, a model of habitat quality that has a whole bunch of stuff in it, as, as you can see here. And we had to head out into the woods in order to try to collect all the data uh, to fill out the model. And, and we did that. And when we finally had it full, we found that it did a very good job of predicting the use of space by bears. And areas that the model predicted to be very good habitat were used heavily by the bears. And areas that the model predicted to be lousy habitat were avoided by the bears. We also went out and in designated sites harvested foods through the course of, of the year so that we knew the productivity of major foods for the bears in different years. One of the major foods during the summer is berries. And if, if it's a berry, bears eat it. And we harvested blueberries, huckleberries, raspberries, blackberries, all sorts of stuff. And, and we also measured the energy content of, of those berries so that we knew both the the variation in productivity across space and across years, but we also knew the energy available to the bears. During the spring, 
we harvested a food called squaw root because this was the first food that bears sometimes really chow down on in the spring. It is, um, has about the same energy content as berries. Um, and as with berries, some years it's abundant, some years it's not. Uh, berries and squall root vary both across time and space. And, and you'll note that the production of squall root in, um, in kilograms per hectare is similar to the production of berries. And this turns out to be important. We'll come back to that later. We also worked with the, with the state uh, wildlife agency to, uh, to index the productivity of, of uh, nuts in the fall, looking at acorns, hickory nuts, beech nuts. And again, we've got tremendous variation across years, but in most years, at least some trees were, were, producing, were producing nuts. And it actually turns out that the Southern Appalachians is one of the best places in North America for blackberries. The, the productivity of foods in, in every season is, is, is tremendous. And it exceeds the, the, the productivity of foods in most other places in, in North America. We found some patterns in the data. And, and one is that the higher the productivity of, of nuts in the fall, the less the bears move. And, and we, we were able to show that both by the, um, the, 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 the average movement speed and also by the sizes of, of the home ranges. And the standard hypothesis for this is that when hard mast is abundant, bears can reach their target rate weights for the fall more easily. They don't have to search as widely in order to put on the fat to make it through the winter. But when, when, um, when nuts are scarce, then they have to travel further to find them. And, and that makes sense. Uh, there is no real strong pattern between the daily movements or the home range sizes uh, of bears and the berry production during the summer. I would have predicted that, that you'd see the same pattern as you do with, with, um, with hard mast, with the nuts, but you don't see that pattern. And three hypotheses have, have been suggested. One is that bears really do respond to variation in, in berries, but just on a scale that we couldn't document. Uh, another is that, uh, that bears might avoid putting on weight in the summer so that they can stay spry and quick and get away from people. And poaching was a major problem during, during the years of, of my study. So um, bears did want to stay away from people. And the third option was that bears always forage as intensively as possible. And what we see in, in our data is just variations on the, that maximum uh, rate of foraging. Finally, for squaw root, uh, we found that the higher the production of squaw root, the more the, bear, the bears moved and the bigger their, their spring home ranges were. And at first, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. That's just the opposite of the pattern for a hard mast. But it makes sense if bears are unable to maintain a positive energy balance on squaw root. So we, we, we had measured the, the, um, the energy available in the squaw root. And that didn't really make sense, but it this is about the only hypothesis we could, fig we could figure. So, um, so we end up with the data leading me to some confusion and to some hypotheses um, that then I decided to turn things around and develop a model that to see if the model predicted what the bear did, even though the model came after the data. So uh, I looked at what if assume bears forage optimally during the different seasons, and let's see what those optimal foraging patterns would be, and then look to see if that matches what the bear did. And of course, we still, if, 
if, if the important thing is that the data and the models are independent, and if the models don't predict the data, we still have you know, the options of the model's wrong, or we don't understand something. And uh, I'm hoping it's the we don't understand something that we then go back and reevaluate that, that that's important. Well, at this point, I got to thinking about the long history of, of foraging models for small passerines in winter. And you might wonder why. Well, in northern winters, the small birds have to forage all day to acquire enough fat to fast all night. And uh, if they have to put on more fat in order to make it through the night, their probability of starving during the night goes up. And that's the same kind of a situation that bears run into on an annual basis. Another thing is that for, for small passerines, the optimal pattern seems to be to forage as early and as, and as energetically as possible to try to meet that, that afternoon fat level as soon as possible, and then once you get there, coast. Except, if fat birds are slow, then they have to sort of get on enough fat in the morning to, to get them to a reasonable place, and then coast during the afternoon and, and, and forage energetically in the evening to get there so that during the middle of the day, they can, they can be active and, and avoid predators. And I, it struck me that those situations met, you know, were, were paralleled by, by black bears. And black bears forage vigorously all summer to put on enough fat for winter. And they appear to try to get that fat on as soon as possible. But if extended movements might increase mortality from hunting or poaching or roadkill, maybe they'd put off foraging in the summer and then try to, to catch up in the fall. And you could say, come off it. Bears forage like chickadees. Bears and chickadees are completely different. Bears are big. Chickadees are tiny. Bears live for decades. Chickadees live for a year. And bears don't breed till an age when most chickadees are dead. But we'll go back to both bears and chickadees have to survive a series of gorge fast events. To reproduce, both bears and chickadees have to survive the entire series. And this series is dominant in the lives of both bears and chickadees. So I think using parallel approaches is, is, uh, is okay. And I built a dynamic programming model for bears to look at the optimal foraging strategies for putting on winter fat. I split the year into three seasons, uh, one for each of the major foods for the bears in my study area, a squaw root season, a berry season, and a hard mast season. I assume the bears expend energy to forage using standard equations for metabolic rate. And that bears, uh, I, for the model, I looked at bears foraging at low, medium, or high levels. And I looked at food being, in any season, low, medium, or high, and independent of the other seasons. And that bears that move more have higher mortality from hunting and poaching and roadkill. And what I, here's what I found that um, during the fall, the optimal foraging, the, the energetic level for foraging goes down with the higher the, the mass production, which is what the bears really do do. For, uh, for summer and the berry season, uh, the model predicts that bears should be foraging as, as energetically as possible all, all summer. And only if things are, if the, if the productivity of berries is really, really high might they cut back on, on foraging. 
And that's kind of what the bears do. I mean, we don't see a, a major pattern. We don't see any changes. And the model predicts that there shouldn't be changes. And then given what, what we know about the energy available in squall root, the model predicts that bears should forage energetically on squall root as soon as it becomes available in the spring. But that's not what the bears do. They're clearly doing something else. And so it bothered me. I wanted to know what the bears know about squall root that I didn't know. And so I got to thinking about squall root and back to my hypothesis on uh, bears not being able to get enough energy from it. And all I could do was say, well, let's take a look at what happens with the model. If I force the digestibility of squall root to be so low that bears expend more energy searching for it in, um, in years when it's scarce, then they're able to get out of it. And uh, so I did do that. And that way I could make the model predict what the bears actually do. And the model then suggests that, that uh, even though, you know, with bomb calorimetry, squall root has as much energy in it as, uh, as blueberries and huckleberries and, and blackberries, in reality, it doesn't. It, it must, be, must have a much lower digestibility than, than we would have predicted. And uh, indeed, in, in, the, in the springtime, in years when squall root is scarce, uh, our bears lost weight during the spring. And in years when squall root was abundant, they started putting on weight during, during the spring. So that all, all matches. And, um, and the prediction is that, that if we could actually do some, some feeding tests with bears, we'd find that uh, squall root should have low predictability, uh, ha should have low digestibility. And so there's my end result. Black bears appear to use the same rules for foraging to survive their winter fast as small passerines used to survive their, their uh, nightly fasts in winter. And that, uh, that strategy is as soon as, as soon as food is available, start foraging and start putting on fat. And for the bears, um, I could see no sign of change in behavior uh, to try to avoid uh, hunting or poaching. And that's it. <laughs> and I got time for a few questions if, if you want to ask them. Yes. Uh, when squall root is is rare in the spring, they lose weight. They they simply can't do it. They they, uh, they come out of their dens at about the same time, but uh, they don't move a whole lot, and they 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 don't cover a whole lot of space, and uh, and it's only during during summer that that they start moving a lot. Now bears have diverse diets. They eat a whole bunch of stuff. And, and the squaw root and, and berries are low in protein. So they have to be eating something other than those two foods in, in those two seasons. And uh, about the first protein they're, they're able to get is digging up ant nests and things like that during, during the spring. And then, of course, they go after beetle larvae and they dig up yellow jacket nests and stuff like that during the, during the summer. Yeah. Um, we didn't document it, but I expect they do. I mean, that's it's a good source of protein. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of stuff down in the west. Yeah, I, I, we just couldn't document it, that's all. Uh, there could, I could have. 
I didn't because I didn't anticipate this showing up. And, uh, um, and I'd like to do that. Just haven't. 